Hey now, welcome to the dirty side of the track, America's leading Formula One podcast. I'm Brian, that's Rob. It's the holidays, Christmas, Hanukkah, New Year, whatever, everybody. Let's get happy. <laughs> I'm already getting happy. Uh, we are celebrating our fake Christmas in the Vale household here because uh, we are heading back to the UK for the first time since uh, COVID uh, next week. So we needed to make sure that the kids got their presents. So we told them we'd had a word with Santa and uh, it's all coming this weekend. So as we sit here today on Saturday, it is my fake Christmas Eve. So I'm already a few glasses of red wine in. <laughs> and, uh, I like how look- you do that. I yeah. Like do and looking forward to closing out. The season one of The Dirty Side, as we said last week, uh, this will be our last episode of the year. Uh, You guys can all just relax and enjoy uh, Christmas Day or whatever you're doing next week, and you won't need to listen out for us. Um, But before we get there, one final episode. Yeah, a bumper edition. (laughs) <laughs> a bumper edition of News and Social, because a lot happened this week, both in the news and Brian went massively active in video land. So we've got a nice bumper selection of that. Then we're going to take a look at season one of the dirty side now we're not going to do the lazy sitcom way out here so i've been binge watching seinfeld on netflix uh, for a while now i think i'm on my third go around in a row uh, of just watching it and every time i get to the hundredth episode i i get that little shot of disappointment where i'm like oh what can i do for the hun- oh yeah that's right they're just gonna do knitted together clips of the previous 99 <laughs> because they couldn't be bothered to write a hundredth episode script but we're not gonna do that we're gonna We're going to do a little walk down memory lane of how this all started, some of our main pieces and parts. Uh, Then we've got our uh, shout outs to all the various guests and DRS guests that have been on over the year. And then we're going to end up with our alternative uh, end of year awards, uh, the highly prestigious Dirty Side Awards. Um, And that'll be that for the year, Brian. Sounds great. I am excited. Everybody's here. Let's get started, man. So this week kind of kicked off early with a bang. The team principal, merry-go-round, carousel, revolving door, silly season. What happened? Like, And how much of that was queued up in advance? It just was wild. It, it all had to be like domino effect ready to go, it wasn't it? Be. It's like, because it was literally as soon as the first pieces started uh, falling into place. So uh, Fred Vasseur... I think the first announcement was he left Alpha, right? So he's leaving right. Alpha. So, ooh, what's going on now? And, and then, then 32 minutes later. Yeah. <laughs> like minutes later, the dominoes start going, and now it's Fred to Ferrari. So, which, before we pursue the domino effect, let's pause as the first domino falls. I'm pretty happy with this one. I mean, I am too. I- I'm, I'm hopeful that he can straighten out some of the strategic issues and some of the sort of team approach to things and hold people accountable However, you know, Ooh. he worked with Charles at Alfa Romeo when Charles drove there. So now is is there like a, a is Charles going to be clearly number one? Or are they going to, you know, mark it that way at some point in the season? You know, if it's close. Well, that's not a however to me. That's a good thing because maybe they'll actually go into the season with a designated number also, one driver. I also like Carlos and he did really well. And, you know, do you yeah, want to like Sergio and he's a number two. So you're just a big fan of number twos. <laughs> Hi-o. <laughs> anyway, what I was going to say, and I'm probably going to get this completely wrong, but I did read it on the internet, so it must be true, Has is be. that um, Fred is the first Ferrari external hire since Jean Tot, I believe, who was also the last successful team principal. So everybody they've had in between, because they've had about like six of them, well, maybe three or four, um, they've all been internal promotions. So they're kind of finally going back to the whole, hey, maybe promoting from within isn't the right way to go. Let's get somebody that knows what they're doing. Um, and that, I know that's really mean to the people who have been promoted from within, but it'll just be interesting because it is a change to what Ferrari have done for the past decade yeah. or however long it is. That's right. Um, so, yeah, I'm in, in, excited about that one. So that leaves an open space at Alfa Romeo. But we're so, not really filling the space at Alfa Romeo, are we? Because yeah, Andrea Seidel I, left the team principal role at McLaren, which we'll come back to, and he took Zach Brown's equivalent role at Alfa Romeo. He's true. the CEO. And so it was always interesting because really the only team I ever felt who had two leaders out in public was Zach Brown and Andrea Seidel at at uh, McLaren. And so Zach made the CEO role, you know, a public facing kind of thing and still had a team principal. So I think Andrea Seidel is like, yo, I want a role like that. I don't want to have to do all this work sitting on the pit lane and actually working. Just I just want to meander and walk around and structure things for success. And Alfa Romeo's like, we got an opening. 
you want to fill half of it? And they're like, sure. So now he's the CEO. That's the way I read it. Yeah. Because I think I mean, they still need a team principal. Do they? Maybe they do. Because the way all the news outlets reported it, they were all doing kind of like the bingo sheet of team principals. And they've put him in there. So and they're not showing that there's an open spot at Alpha. But, but maybe F1 you're right. But put an asterisk on their picture. And it Ooh. said he is the CEO, not okay. the team principal. So maybe he'll become like a CEO on the pit lane wall. I don't know. But uh, we'll find out. I just figured he was infected with the Zach Brown CEO is a cool role. Just sit there and do nothing, slick your hair back and hang out. <laughs> it could well be that. But obviously he left McLaren. Yes. So we had an open spot at McLaren, um, which again, within about 25 seconds, uh, <laughs> it felt was kind of announced that Andrea Stella was coming in to take uh, the role at McLaren, which, uh, yeah, great. Uh, I hear he makes a great beer. <laughs> And then at Williams, a little bit prior to the these dominoes happened, Yost Capito left Williams. And I I think we figured out why. I'm not sure. It really hasn't been announced. But he is a new recipient of a Dirty Side of the Track t-shirt. And I'm assuming he wanted to wear it as much as he liked whenever he liked. And Williams might have had a problem with that. So yeah. I'm sort of figuring that's why he left. Rob, I, I'm thoughts? with you. So because because. It was uh, when the news broke that he was leaving, a uh, friend of the show, Rob Reed of Forbes, sent me a picture, uh, a, a note saying, I've just given him the t-shirt as well. Should I try and get it back? I'm like, <laughs> I don't think we can pull that move. But however, it's like you say, it's probably because he wants to be loud and proud, be out there. Uh, I'm expecting an email any time in our inbox to say that he wants to come on and be a third, uh, third barstool uh, sitter. Um, and that's oh. why he's left Williams, because he couldn't be impartial if he stayed there. Which We'd is... have to interview him. I mean... You yeah, know, exactly. We'll he could be a guest. But uh, so wait, the rumor there that I saw you typed in that I actually had been thinking as well. There's only there are very few female drivers who have, you know, sort of been around a team in F1 uh, and actually gotten the car out. One of them, Susie Wolf, Toto's wife, an amazing driver in her own right. I've talked about her on free, uh, other podcasts of ours earlier. She was a test driver for Williams when Valtteri was there. So, wouldn't she be great returning to Williams? And you could have a, a family divided well, Williams okay, let, and Mercedes, let's go down but that Mercedes rabbit. power units are already at Williams. I, I mean, this I could know. be. So let's go down that rabbit hole for a minute yeah. because I saw I saw it. Uh, I followed a thread on Twitter, and it's now been attributed to two or three news outlets. And and who knows what constitutes news these days? But people are running with this story that Susie Wolf is going to be the team principal at Williams. So if she is, I mean. It's just, I, c I can just see, you know, breakfast in the wolf household coming up to a race weekend. And they're both trying to kind of like tease race strategy out of each other. So looks like we might have rain this weekend, Susie. Uh, <laughs> what are you thinking? And uh, I just, how does that dynamic work? How do you separate work and personal when well, you've got two team principals in the same house? I wanted to say, I wanted to say that it would be great if they bought... Uh, Mercedes bought Williams and you had a sister team situation and it wouldn't be a sister team it'd be a wife husband wife team spouse team whatever you want to call it but then I remember Doralton uh, bought the team from the Williams family and I doubt they're going to give them a discount on the price um, if anything it would be incredibly expensive so well, and talking of incredibly expensive yes. there was another breaking news story this week that and I haven't heard of this guy, but I had once I'd read the article. Hong Kong billionaire Calvin Lo uh, is weighing up entering F1 in 2026. Um, there, a lot of the talk was around actually creating a new team, plowing some of his billions into creating a brand new team. But there's also the whole, uh, there was a part of the interview that kind of he conceded that that might be pretty difficult to be a complete new entrant. And it might be that he needs to uh, buy a team instead. But basically, he's got some cash in his uh, burning a hole in his pocket, like I guess, you know, most billionaires do. And he <laughs> wants to go and buy something and he wants to buy an F1 team. Um, so that would be interesting. 2026, kind of all roads lead to 2026. You know, it's yep. our, our next big kind of reg change. We've got Audi coming in as well. Yep. We've got billionaires thinking they're uh, champing at the bit to get in. So um, it just still seems so far off to get too excited about it. It does. You know what? A, a story that went way under the radar was another billionaire and the idea of getting into F1. We've long talked about Andretti Global and we kind of laughed at their tweet about how they checked all the boxes and blah, blah, blah. And everyone's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. However, recently it's been sort of put out there that Mark Walter, the CEO of Guggenheim Partners, a billionaire in his own right, is interested in backing and already has backed the Andretti bid. And that F1 is much more interested in the Mark Walter money 
than the Andretti name. And so we'll see if any of that is true. But that, I would just say this, Mark Walter bought the Dodgers. And I actually know a little bit about the financing because I worked at one of the uh, Guggenheim-related companies at one point. So it's a, a pretty interesting thing that I don't think is getting a lot of press, but I'd be willing to bet the Andretti idea comes up again uh, and competes with the Calvin Lowe uh, conversation. So let's keep our eyes peeled. I could be way off, but give us a couple years on this one because it is a 2026 uh, yeah, type and, idea and, as well. And again, another 2026. So Red Bull came out this week and have declared that they want the whole operation of Red Bull to be located in their Milton Keynes factory from 2026. So we know that the Honda relationship is kind of the end they've stopped supplying the engine but they haven't they're kind of in there as here's an engine and we're going to be on a consultancy basis for you while you get your arms around it they're going to completely take it in-house and build everything and they want the whole kit and caboodle to be out of um milton Keynes factory from 2026 onwards now part of me i like the idea of it all being located in one place that sounds cool the other part is i wonder if like some of the accountants are kind of just are, are they are they, <laughs> are they breathing a sigh of relief like oh it's all in one place there's only one set of tax regulations to deal with or are they going oh man now we've only got one set of tax regulations to hide things in <laughs> I, just... I had not thought of the cost cap I'm sure they're thinking maybe it's less travel which would be good but now it's extra catering uh oh I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that uh, um, anyway and then your boy Mick this must have been a great day for you when it was officially announced, which I think we all kind of knew was coming. But Mick, out of the Ferrari Driver Academy, which we knew was happening, but he was officially signed as a Mercedes Reserve Driver. At this point, I'm stop talking and let Rob have the floor. Well, I think we I actually made that outlandish prediction a while back when all the first rumors started around Haas uh, getting rid of him. I said, fine, he goes to Mercedes, he gets the Reserve Driver gig, he does his time there for a little bit until Lewis finally decides to call time. If he's shown that he can handle that car well and he's a viable driver, then you move George up to uh, number one as you give uh, Lewis his gold watch and bid him farewell. And you bring Mick in as uh, uh, the second driver there. So, for, you know, all the dominoes are falling into place, Brian. They're all falling into place. I mean, and you know I love a good... <laughs> acronym or you know name for for somebody and carlando was my thing i loved it i bought in and then we had charlos the signs and then hashtag pukey so if you have mick and lewis on the same team is it lick ham i don't think they're no they're not the two drivers i'm sorry well, that's the only one that one. works with I, mick and lewis is lick. I, I was thinking you were, i was trying to work out where you were going with george and mick uh, i was it's just like no jick lick uh, lick ham morge <laughs> Oh boy. Anyway, you'll have a while yeah. to work on that one mm. because I don't think Lewis is hanging up his helmet just yet. So, oh, uh, um, couple bit of kind of track related um, bits and pieces. Uh, Saudi Arabia are going to be hosting the season opener in 2024. Um, I mean, not really much more to announce than that. Really, the it just they've obviously got paid the a money. bit of cash, exactly. got the money, and they're gonna yeah. And then we close in Abu Dhabi, and anyone else who wants to buy their spot on the calendar can apparently do so. Exactly. Now, I'll let you do the next one because you found this and I couldn't find it for ages until you told me exactly where right. to zoom in, but it's so cool. It is, uh, for anybody who has a couple minutes on your hands, not even, 30 seconds, you can even follow along now if you're interested. Open a web browser now, now, now. All right. So Google Paul Ricard. Just Paul Ricard, type it in and move over to in the Google map on the far right, at least on my browser, the map of Paul Ricard. If you go to the map of Circuit Paul Ricard and you start kind of heading a little bit south of the center area of the track and a little bit towards the east, kind of towards what you'd see at first level driving center or a karting circuit. Keep scrolling in, zooming in, zooming in. I'll wait a second if you're with me. You will now see the Leclerc parking spot. And if you click on it, it is the exact spot where Charles crashed. And there are 11 pictures of his crash associated with the Google map. So oh. whomever did that, Super big kudos. I found that utterly hilarious. I love Easter eggs like that. That was brilliant. Um, Although not like me, because when you just sent me the very short WhatsApp that kind of said, yeah, Google Paul Ricard and then go south and east or whatever, down into the right of the track. So I literally went beyond the track, down. Like I'm not even looking at the circuit anymore. I'm like zooming into little tiny French villages thinking, what's he found? <laughs> well, now so I know. Hopefully those endless... instructions were easier for everybody else to follow. Yeah, stay inside the boundary of the circuit and you'll yes. be fine. Uh, the winner of the t-shirt, this is the last call, Red Bolino Balotelli 21. Last call, uh, email us at dirtysideofthetrack at gmail.com or on Twitter at F1 Dirty Side. We are writing off the liability at the end of the year, meaning there will be no more t-shirts. So 
let us know. And Rob, I'm gonna turn this one to you because yeah, I talking am to, jazz. talking to merch. <laughs> so everyone knows I've become a little bit obsessed with doing uh, liveries of various um, guises. Uh, we've been hitting the World Cup hard at the moment. Um, and we started it all off with our 1980s themed cars. So we had the A-Team, Knight Rider, Ghostbusters, so and cool. you name it. We did a bunch of them. We had 10 of them. And Brian said to me jokingly, we should arrange them on a poster and we'll put them on the site. So, I wasn't joking. I was serious. Well, and he wasn't joking and he was serious. And therefore I've done it and it will be going up on the store soon. So we have an F1 grid. Uh, with our F1 versus uh, the 80s, um, which will be available on our Redbubble store soon. So Found now, through DirtySideOfTheTrack.com. Correct. So I tried to go on there and set it up myself, and that site's not the easiest. And I ended up, uh, rather than putting it on a poster, putting it on a pair of curtains, which actually looked pretty cool <laughs> anyway. But um, I don't think we'll make the curtains available unless we get some kind of big demand for them. But we thinking, I was showing it to a buddy of mine. He's got into F1 this year as well. And uh, but he's also a huge Pittsburgh Penguins fan. He's like, man, he's like, yeah. He said, I think that would really work if you did crossovers with other sports. So when it gets around to like, not now when we're in the regular season, but when we get to the playoffs of the ice hockey for the Stanley Cup and maybe for the Super Bowl, you know, you should do another one. So there's already now an NFL one in the works with a uh, instead of a track, it will be a field. Uh, and we'll, I think I've already done the Green Bay one for Brian. So uh, we'll just hope that they get through i was gonna say i'm happy you did it already because i don't know if they're sniffing the playoffs <laughs> anyway before we move on from this one just a quick mention of the world cup um because tomorrow as we're recording on saturday here tomorrow is the world cup final it will be the last i promise uh livery blast much to brian's relief uh where i take control of the twitter account and send out two pictures um i might combine it i might mix it up for the final however um i'm either <laughs> going to be really really happy or really really sad tomorrow based on the outcome of the world cup i was just telling brian as we were about to record me and my two brother-in-laws do a we regularly do a, an accumulator or for the US a parlay which I still think is something you do when you want to speak to a pirate captain but um, what? there was a parlay when they want to talk to the pirate captain when you get captured on films you never seen the any kind of pirate film Brian uh, no that maybe that's why it makes sense to you but to me I can't th I can't go onto my uh, DraftKings app and, and take it seriously when it tells me I want to do a parlay but anyway uh, as I sit here on Saturday, all five of our Saturday games came in. Uh, my brother-in-law also decided to add Argentina in as the sixth game of our six-game uh, accumulator. We have six bucks on this, uh, these, five, these six games. And if Argentina comes in tomorrow, we'll be up to 300 bucks, which I'm very, very excited about. Uh, or I'm going to watch Fran France win and be very, very sad. So... <laughs> I don't know if I'm supposed to cheer against you or what. I don't, or for you. I don't know. I mean, it's absolutely nailed on. I bought, when I went into the uh, liquor store today, I bought Argentinian red wines. So that positive karma is naturally going to get everything across the line tomorrow. Messi is going to score a hat trick and uh, everything will be amazing. So I'm let's just see. I'm going to be watching that... it on a phone at a tailgate for the Bears game. So I'll try to uh, send my positive vibes your way. Well, we'll see if this ages well by the time this gets published tomorrow as to whether or not any of that made any yeah. sense at all. <laughs> anyway, over to you, my yeah, friend, on the last video closeout of the yeah, year. Yeah, large edition. So we didn't do this last week when Nate was here. Um, and we'd done a very brief run the week prior, but then before that we had Paul and Rob. So we, we really haven't done a lot of videos. These are all relatively current. I'm going to do them sort of quick because there's a lot. So first off, funniest F1 moments of 2022. There were a lot of 2022 retrospectives. This one was definitely worth your time. Definitely is worth your time. Five minutes, puts a smile on your face. A lot of F1 journalists in it kind of acting silly, but I really enjoyed um, the 2022 funniest moments. Uh, it was great. Ferrari just launched today a C-squared challenge, the, or last night, actually, the Head Basket Challenge. Charles Leclerc, Carlos Sainz, six minutes. It's actually one of their better challenges. So... Check it out. Charles was not messing around. He took this incredibly seriously, like pointing at the line. And I mean, he was, check it out. It was well, definitely. Well, Fred's come in now, so he's got to show that he's professional in everything <laughs> yeah, he does, right? He's exactly right. Exactly right. And then WTF1 had their Christmas games with Charles Leclerc. I did not like this one. I actually ended up turning it off. I love every, almost every Maddie WTF1 video. I usually love when they have Charles on. They had a bunch at the end of the year. I don't know. They're playing a kazoo and trying to figure out the song, a Charles Nuno songs, and I'm like, yeah, next. <laughs> so I'd recommend skipping that one. Um, and then F1 Channel again had a 2022 F1 season animated. I was so excited for this video because I loved last year's. It's just animations with radio clips, and I was disappointed this year. It's only two minutes, but they combined sounds from completely different events 
like one driver from one race and a driver from another and tried to make it into something different, which was weird. And they, in two minutes, they worked in two fart jokes, which were not at all funny. It would be like if I took a clip of you saying thank you, played a fart sound, and then played your thank you. Like, wh- who who's for? I mean, like, <laughs> it was it was not good. So if you skip the animated this year, you'll be uh, okay. Um, I was I was told by a couple listeners and by Rob, it's always fun when you find something a little far out there. So I, I went 10 little known things you didn't know about Charles Leclerc. I don't know if the title is great. Um, from the F1 Reporter Channel. Not good. It's 11 minutes long. I did learn a tiny bit about Charles, but it was like I couldn't tell if it was computer narrated or personal narrated, but they kept mispronouncing so many words throughout and it was like discombobulating it was definitely not worth the 11 minutes so if you skip that great if you're a huge Charles fan then check it out like me uh, and just get ready for to cringe a little bit as you go uh Lewis Hamilton gives his number one mechanic an epic hot lap on the Mercedes channel this was great it's only a couple minutes Nathan his mechanic retiring um, just check it out. I love hot laps as it is. I love when the dr- passenger is so freaked out by the driver. Lewis did an awesome job giving him a goodbye. You could tell they really, like he really cared for him. Great hugs. It was amazing. I actually saw this one. I, yeah. I, I agree. I think this one is, uh, it, like you say, it's two minutes of your life and I think it's a great video to watch. So go check it out. Yeah. And they passed Valtteri at the end, which was cool because Valtteri's out in a Alfa Romeo, I think a Julia. I couldn't tell. He went by him so fast, but he's like, there's Valtteri. And they waved and then passed him because they were in a, a GT. So, um, and a quick note, just as an aside, and I don't know if you saw this one, Rob, but Lewis was working with Mercedes team and they were able to set up the simulator for Lewis's brother, Nicholas. And Nicholas has cerebral palsy and was the first disabled person, I'm quoting here, to drive the Mercedes simulator. His brother's a huge race fan, and he does esports and all kinds of other things and, and races a bunch. I mean, he's like a, he, you know, he's, it's not like it was just for fun. I mean, this is a, a guy who's got talent, but with a disability, it becomes a challenge. I love that they did this, that Lewis worked on this, that the Mercedes team made this happen. If you saw some of the clips, like pictures, you could just see how happy and excited everybody was. Man, I don't know. It was just two great Lewis stories in a row for me. And I, I'm not necessarily Team LH, but I thought that was really cool to see both of those things. Yeah, and the next one you've got here, I saw as well. Look at me checking out some videos. Well, I think <laughs> I did anyway, based on your description. So the top 10 best battles of 2022 um, on the F1 channel. You know when you don't need to over-egg special effects and right. trying to be funny and put fart jokes in, all this kind of stuff, and you can just take epic battles of last season and just thread them all into, into a montage and just go, there you go, enjoy. And that's what they did. They left so us good. alone to just enjoy, like you've written here, I think, nine minutes it must weigh in at of just memory lane of 2022 for all the best bits. It was just so well done. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, so good. Just a great way to go back through the season. Uh, I'm going to close on... on a strong one, but one dud before we get there. The C squared challenge, they released two in a week. Um, the perfect pour challenge with Estrella Galicia 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.0, I'd call it. Don't watch it. It's three minutes of your life where you could be doing something else. It's so bad. It's There's no redeeming qualities to it whatsoever. <laughs> I was so turned off by it, I almost skipped the next one, the head basket thing, thinking if it's as bad as the last, like... Just skip the perfect port challenge. So, and, and did you stick with it for all three minutes to see if there were any redeeming factors? I did. And then at the end, there's like a non sequitur. It's not even bloopers. They just cut to another version. I'm like, what the... F- so, so just, you know, for everybody out there, you know, this is Brian doing a public service for you guys, right? So <laughs> I just hope you make sure that none of you go and... I mean, if you do go and watch these just to see how bad they are, to see if you agree or disagree with Brian, then please let us know on Twitter. But uh, I just want you to know the effort that he goes into here <laughs> to help. <laughs> we're closing strong. I said it was a long one. I'm, I hope you enjoy some of these, but these three are great. And here we go. First off, the cool down room, episode three of Lollipop Man. Oh, my God. It was so great. I think I tweeted about this one when it came out. It's three minutes. I'm not going to give away my favorite part. I'm just going to say there's a highlight on Matias' desk. Just watch for the that to happen. Rob, did you see this one? And do you know yeah, what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. You got to watch it. You got to watch it. And then Sebastian Vettel's funniest moments on the F1 channel. Six minutes long. But just a retrospective of the fun he's had in his career. Check it out. It is so good. Goodbye, Seb. We will miss you. And... 
to, uh, well, I, just, said, I was going to say, just before you introduce this one, this is, this is like your Christmas present to me because this I challenged is. you the other week. I challenged you, sorry, the other week. I said, we haven't had a Hilton Honors channel video for a while, Brian. Make it so. And, and you've gone and done it. <laughs> I did. And it's really good. Um, it is This or That with Lando Norris on the Gulf Oil channel. I'm not kidding. <laughs> and so if you go to the Gulf Oil Channel, Gulf's a McLaren sponsor. Um, if you go to the Gulf Oil Channel, it's only a minute and 20 seconds. But they rolled out the red carpet for this thing. First of all, it's Naomi Schiff, who's amazing. She does the interview. Perfect. Second, it's this or that. Rapid fire, no dilly-dally with Lando. It was great. The only problem is it's only a minute and 20. 80 seconds in, it's over. So I was disappointed. I would have enjoyed more, but check it out. We'll have the links to all these on the show notes on the podcast. So Yeah, thanks for finding so many. So I have to copy and paste so many links into the show notes, Brian. Thanks for that. But being as you did find something more obscure than the Hilton channel, I mean, the Gulf Oil channel, I mean, it's going to be a big 2023 if you can find something more obscure than that. You've set the bar pretty high there. I'm ready. Um, but talking to 2023, that means that... Uh, which is next year, that will be our season two starting in the new year. So before we get there, uh, before we hang up our mics for the year, we thought we would do like a tease at the beginning, kind of a, just a little bit of a retrospective of um, kind of a walk on the dirty side. We've spent a year now, two days past a year, in fact, December 15th, 2021, uh, we dropped the first episode. I can't remember if we've ever said this, but, and if we haven't, uh, apologies for repeating myself, but that first episode was actually never supposed to air. Uh, when Brian convinced me that we should do this pod uh, in uh, Thanksgiving 2021 and we kind of decided we were going to do it and we got the equipment, we were like, well, let's do a dry run and just see what happens and then we'll know what to tweak for next time. And we were like two little kids. We were so pleased with ourselves <laughs> when we'd finished that I think the unanimous decision was, screw it, let's just publish it. And that was it. That was episode one of The, the Show Side. was born. <laughs> Um, and kind of, you know, the, the the little twists and turns that we've had throughout the year have just been like I, nothing I ever thought would even happen. So like right back from the first episode, sending it to Paul and saying, uh, have a listen to this. If you think we suck, let us know because we'll stop doing it. And not only did he think we didn't suck, he actually came on and... Uh, and our, only our fourth ever episode. I didn't. Th I thought it was much longer than this. When I was looking back on it, I thought it was almost like ten episodes in before we had our first guest. But looking back over it, episode number four, Paul came on and gave us his first interview about uh, his twenty plus years in F one. It was um, brilliant. And it was kind of a teaser trailer for the way Paul was going to probably play a little bit more of a role in the, as the show as we move forward. Which has been amazing. Oh, it's been fantastic. Um, and then we managed to fill the off-season with kind of random stuff. We kind of had uh, looking at drivers, what, what would then go on to be called Vale's Tales. Um, we started churning out our predictions, looking at the new regulations, and we did our beginner's guide to F1 as well, which I went back and listened to. I've got to say, Brian, I think, I think we, we, were, we absolutely nailed it. Did we? <laughs> no. <laughs> Yeah, then we were really lucky, as Rob said, kind of hinted at when Paul came on to talk about his time in F1. Um, he came back and talked about the Braun GP story. And that was one of my favorite episodes of season one, as we're calling it. Uh, I loved it. I loved hearing the chaos of a one-year team that was able to do what they did. To have Paul describe being in the truck driving to testing and had to pull over to see if he should continue or not if they had money. I mean, like all of the stories he told about that season that I did not appreciate, but being able to hear it from someone, A, who was there, but also B, tells it really clearly and in an interesting and funny way. Man, that was that was great. So if someone hasn't it listened still goes, to that, go back yeah, and it's, check it's, it out. It still goes down as one of my favorite episodes. And I think, especially as now they're going to be, I believe they are making the film of the Braun year, right? Um uh, it's been rumored that they're going to make the film of the Brawn year because uh, they're tapping you up, Brian, aren't they, to play Jensen Button? That's um, correct. That's correct. Uh, <laughs> then I think ahead of that coming out, then go check that episode out and listen it, listen to it from the horse's mouth. Um, not calling you a horse, Paul. I know people give you <laughs> I know people give you grief over your teeth, but uh, we'll leave that for another what? day. Uh, <laughs> Where did that come from? Jesus well, Christ! <laughs> he knows it's true. Um, then we carried on rolling <laughs> oh, through. God. Season still hadn't started. We kind of took a look at the uh, fantasy. F1, but really kind of it really kicked off March 20th, Bahrain, first race review, and the first appearance of the legend that was Pet Lane Paul. Yeah. Um, Paul Harris, thank you, man. It, having you on the Pit Lane Paul aspect 
both giving us sort of the inside view of the race, but then also the travel facts. Travel I mean, facts. the song. Oh. <laughs> you even because of you, we were able to do the song, Andy. Thank you. And because of that, we know more about the the song in the pits. I mean, wow! Just it all came together. <laughs> It was, and 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 then we started rolling into a period of time where my brain kept exploding on a regular basis, which is a watching the Buzzsprout stats of people are actually listening to us. It's not just like me and you talking to each other. And, and thank then, uh... you, listeners, for that. <laughs> yeah, I, well, that's where I was going. I was well, like, we'll get there. I got a whole big shout out in my awards. So, so couldn't believe the fact that people were listening. Looking at the stats. Uh, from Buzzsprout as to where people were listening through to us from. It was mainly kind of US, UK, which you'd kind of expect. But then we got some Australian listeners, Mark. Uh, we had kind of South Africa, Israel, um, China, Israel. It was kind of it was just America, absolutely yeah. bizarre. So that was the first thing that made my little brain explode was the fact that people seemed to be listening to us and not really hitting us with kind of lots of comments saying, you suck, you suck, you suck. We were actually getting decent feedback. And then... Well, I delete all those before ah, you see them. Ah, thank you. Okay, yeah. cool. Then Monaco came around. And um, <laughs> I got reduced back to being a 16-year-old giddy little lad um, when Paul sent through his uh, post-race review and said, here's the race review. Hey, this is Doug McKagan, and you're listening to the Dirty Side of the Track podcast. I cut out the, and this is pit lane Paul part, just because that makes it easier for us to play it regularly. <laughs> Duff McKagan! I mean, I grew up as a Guns N' Roses fan, so that absolutely melted my brain. Um, then we got a little bit kind of more, like, uh, a brave about things, about not just talking to Paul. We could probably try to talk to other people. And <laughs> turns, out, that, turns out other people have ears and mouths as well. Yeah, apparently so. So Brian went on an amazing... Um, campaign to try to get in contact with ESPN. He, he spam emailed every single yeah. combination known to man and some yeah. combinations not known to man uh, to the ESPN offices to try to get us a foot in the door yeah. and he pulled it off. And yeah. through I won't do the whole story, but through yeah, a convoluted kind of... we don't want to tell people of, so we don't, they don't get spammed from others as well. Yeah, exactly. That's why I didn't mention the yeah. name. Yeah. Um, but through a combination of uh, Brian's persistence, a couple of phone calls, a couple of Zoom calls, uh, we ended up getting Nate Saunders on June 4th uh, coming on the show, which was just... Just amazing. It was so cool to speak to a real-life F1 journalist and someone that goes around all the races, just like Paul, but getting that different insight. You know, Paul's yeah. given us life inside the, the pits and, and Nate's given us life inside the uh, kind of the journalist pen. And it just kind of kept rolling. And then, again, you know, I'm going to hit this in my awards, I promise. But then we had Blake, also known as Break F1, former Red Bull engineer, performance engineer. And Blake was the coolest guy. He just... Sort of out of the blue saw us, you know, it's saw our request to come on. And he's like, yeah, sure. And he just set aside time for two bozos like us. And we had an amazing conversation. And I'm still appreciative to him for doing that. Just the people in F1 are amazing. The people who love F1 are amazing. So it just continued. And we're like, why are people answering our emails? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh and anyway, we had more races. We won't dip into all the railed races. You can all go back on our website and look at the episodes and go through all the race reviews if you want to relive them all. But then we arrive at July 17th, which I'm not sure we've ever mentioned it on the, uh, the pod before, but... This is Jacques Villeneuve, and you're listening to The Dirty Side of the Track. Yeah, I don't think we've ever told anybody. I don't think on. we've ever mentioned it. Oh. Uh, but Thank yeah. you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Again, more thank yous than we can ever possibly give you, but we... Me and Brian somehow spoke to Jack Villeneuve in what was one of the most crazy, I've told the story a number of times, I won't tell it again, but the craziest days of my life uh, resulting in being face-to-face -face with uh, Jack Villeneuve on a hotel bed. Obviously virtually, I wasn't on the bed with him, um, but that was just insane. Was Absolutely insane. insane. And then again, meeting other people throughout the F1 world, the fifth wheel sort of dual episode, having them on here and then we were able to... Uh, turn turn the 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 volume up to eleven on their on their episode where we were swearing like crazy. <laughs> that, that, a that, lot was, of fun. That, that was so funny because we do try to keep this one clean. Yeah, uh, and people won't probably know this uh, because if you only listen to us, then we had we did a whatever it was like an, an hour and a half where we kind of cut it forty five forty five and we did us interviewing the fifth wheel guys, told them to keep it clean. We brought them onto our show and we had the fifth wheel chat along, and then we went onto their show. And their show is rated E for explicit. So me and Brian were allowed to cut loose a little. And I think we maybe over dined out on the fact that we were allowed to. <laughs> also, had, I was also over served. I think I drank my house out of wine that night. Uh, <laughs> we had Paul come back for a mid-season review. 
Um, I thought it was amazing as we ended the season with our retrospectives here recently with Paul and, and Rob Breed. Again, Rob Breed is just amazing. A Forbes journalist. He's a serial entrepreneur, cyclist, successful dude, just a great guy. Um, so, Rob, thank you for being a part of our, our community with us. Um, but just we, we were able to do that. Nate came back, even though I, I wrapped around the Nate interview with a microphone from the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, at <laughs> least it was good during the interview. Uh, but Nate was back, and we just kind of had a conversation and a chat. And, I mean, I, again, I can't say this enough, but it's about everybody. They're all such kind, genuine, amazing people. But there were some lowlights throughout the year. Uh, the word, but actually what I'm going to do, although this might give it away now that you've seen the notes, I forgot I'd written this in here. I'm oh, going to save this save to that? the awards, okay. Brian. Yeah. All right. So, well, then can we talk um, about the DRS guests? Yeah, really let's... So, Brian came to me uh, at one point, and it can't have been too far in because we'll discuss this in a second, but Paul was the first one, right? So it must have been episode four, but again, I thought it took us longer than this to pull well, this Well, we together. did it on nine. It was a, he, we did it with Oh, we did it on nine on the Braum one, did we? Yes. Okay. So Brian came to me and said, look, we, th- we need a way of kind of getting the listeners involved and something that we could do. I, um, I got this idea, uh, like 100 seconds of DRS. I'm like, okay, what's that? And he's like, I don't know. I've just got a name at the moment, and it needs to be <laughs> rapid fire. Like, okay. So... But then it just evolved. We want to do a rapid fire quiz. Um, some F1 questions, some not. You've probably all heard it. And um, we built ourselves a little library of stupid questions and, and away we went. And you guys answered the call. Some of you friends that we probably strong armed into coming on. Some of you voluntarily came on. And then even better than that, random listeners that we didn't even realize were real people other than numbers on Buzzsprout stats started coming out of the, uh, the woodwork. And we met real people and had so much fun with you. It was so amazing. And like, I, I can't thank... There have been 25 guests on the 100 seconds of DRS so far. So basically every other episode we put one together. And often Rob and I can't find time uh, during the week to interview somebody. And sometimes we don't have anybody to interview. So this is a great call. If you haven't been on the 100 seconds of DRS, please let us know for next year. We'd love to meet you. It is fun. Like, I can't explain it. It, it You shouldn't feel nervous. It's We spend as much time talking before the, the, we record than we do during the recording because we want to get to know you. And we, I love it. Like, I love getting to meet more people like me, fans of F1. And so it's just so much fun. And and we're going to quickly go down the list here. Uh, as we said, Paul Harris on our first episode was our first 100 seconds of DR. So Pitlane, Paul, thanks for being the crash test dummy. I just want to highlight something, though, real quick in the beginning. Then my friend Paul Margolis was on. Oh, I don't know if I was supposed to use the last name. Uh, then Mark. Then uh, from Australia, then Lee from the UK, then my friend Mark, then your friend Jim, and then my friend Paul. That's kind of how we got started. So a couple listeners, a couple friends, but we had Paul, Paul, Mark, Lee, Mark, Jim, Paul. That's three Pauls and two Marks in the first six. <laughs> it did seem like you were only allowed to come on DRS if you were called Paul or Mark. Uh, but yeah, and then um, I was in that kind of got the, uh, you know, Mark and Lee, um, Mark from Australia, Lee from the UK, they were kind of the first probably two that came on that were not connected with us at all, which then kind of sort of set off a little bit of a uh, a role. We had um, uh, Steve, the listener that went to uh, Miami. Uh, we had uh, Ben, who actually then turned out to live like just up the road from me and ended up coming to a few of the morning uh, shows at the local sports bar. So it was really cool catching up with Ben and hanging out with him. And then Renato, who's amazing and has a long F1 history. And, and when this here podcast becomes big, I made Renato a promise. He's got to get himself there, but we're going to rent an Airbnb in Baku. And he's welcome to watch the race from the, the little patio thing overlooking the track. So Renato, I'm not giving up on this dream, baby. We're going to make it happen. <laughs> then we had, we had G-Money, Garth. We had JP, who is a, an amazing guy who also does art. And uh, just a tremendous fellow in the Netherlands and who's active on the Discord. I love seeing his comments and having discussions with him. We then had our first uh, family outing as my good friend Az came on uh, uh, from Wales, uh, followed up the following by his son coming on and probably uh, setting off some tension inside that household as uh, they probably argued about who was the best guest. <laughs> <laughs> we, we had Lynn and she went to the Canadian GP, kind of recounted how amazing that was. Lynn was a great guest and has sort of done us a solid, allowed us to buy her tickets for next season at price so she can keep them for the future. Uh, We are super excited and appreciative uh, to Lynn. We then kind of got into the fantasy waters a little more. We'd obviously been playing 
But I'm like, you know, there's a large F1 fantasy community on Twitter, and we had Rob from F1 Fantasy Hub on, and it was great. I mean, I really kind of loved his perspective. And, and I, I did as well, but your face, you just lit up like a kid at Christmas because you're, you know, you're such a fantasy nerd that actually yeah. having a guy on that runs it on Twitter, you, it was just like, yeah, uh, you were so happy that episode. I, I love all of these, like both of us said, but I mean, when you find someone who's a super nerd like me on something, heck yeah. Then when my uh, school friend uh, Ben came on, um, again, not because, this was quite nice, not because I'd strong on armed him into coming on, but because he was just legitimately was kind of like listening to the show and uh, and reached out to came on, which was cool. Uh, so to keep the friend theme going, uh, Brian's friend David came on uh, the following week. Well, I, and I hadn't even talked to David about the podcast. We worked together years ago. We were friends. But then through mutual friends, he heard I had an F1 podcast. I didn't know he was into motorsports. And he te- sent me a text. He goes, hey, you do an F1 podcast? I said, hey, David, how are you? So it was really cool to kind of reconnect. And then again, fantasy, fantasy. We had uh, the Formula Market founder, Dagan, who came on. And Dagan's great dude. Trade a lot of notes regularly. I'm excited for Formula Market to relaunch in 2023. Again, I had a lot of fun fantasy. Love it. Yeah, and then and then we got like um, what well, again went turned on to create like a more ongoing relationship with the show as well is that Paul had been um, I think with Valtteri out in a cycling event um, somewhere in the states. Let's let's go with somewhere in the states because I, I can't right. remember I where. Right. And um, he's uh, Rob Reed from Forbes had been coming along for the cycling event because he does a cycling uh, podcast called Psychology, um, but he also does motorsport as well. So he'd ended up kind of coming along really, I think, more for the cycling and for Tiffany than really for Valtteri, but kind of came along and interviewed Valtteri, was sponging all the Formula One knowledge that Paul could possibly share with him and became, you know, really, really started getting into it. Uh, Paul sent him our way. He listened in, liked the show came on DRS and and then there's kind of uh he's come on a couple of times now and we uh, we love uh, we love the way that uh Rob has contributed to the show and the fact that he's kind of called our um show out on his Forbes article as, a couple of times we just uh again big shout out to you Rob thank you so much for doing that yeah totally and then we had Anthony from the New York area if I remember right Anthony listens to a boatload of podcasts I'm happy one of them is the dirty side he says he really enjoys it I had the best time talking to Anthony he had great questions for us and then when we hung up we kind of got into even more sort of scenarios and questions it was uh, the best time I remember I think we went way over the a lot of time I had to run to like a <laughs> dance thing but I loved it Anthony put a smile on my face man it was great catching up uh, and then back to the fantasy theme really because we had uh, Andy uh, who won our uh, fantasy league by a long way from Brian, like long way, pounded Brian into the yeah. dust. No, like, I, I mean, I can't see Brian it. anymore he, because nope. he just pounded him. He was 26th in the world. I know. <laughs> That's really good. I was 333rd in the world out of 1.6 million, which is really good. And he left me, I, like, he, I couldn't even see his taillights. Um, anyways, great talking to Andy. And then we had Coach Mike. Uh, from Indiana, and Mike, you your energy and enthusiasm was contagious like COVID. Um, can I say? That? <laughs> I'm sure he's going to love that. Yeah, yeah. No, keeping the coaching, uh, keeping the coaching yeah. theme. Um, we then went on to we had Josh on, who's a coach, uh, swim coach of my kids, um, and kind of again, I didn't force him to listen. He kind of I told him about the pod. He listened along. He liked it, and he came on and had some great fun. And to wrap it all out, last week. Um, now that we're getting brave, when we speak to like real famous people like Nate, uh, we managed to convince him to do the 100 seconds of DRS as well. So uh, I'm going to have to start listening now for this week onwards to the pad hoc to see if they steal that, because I'm pretty sure it's going to be a, you know an industry award winning quiz anytime soon. So yeah, Well, they better not steal it. <laughs> I don't think they will. So there we have it. 25 DRS guests. We'd love to make that number way bigger next year. So... Um, we also also need to give a shout out to some of the uh, members that have then joined our Discord community as well. So as well as kind of, and a lot of those are DRS uh, members kind of uh, have all hung out on the Discord server together. I'd love to grow the Discord uh, community a bit more because I think it's really cool watching everyone chat amongst themselves and then we kind of jump in as well. And it's just... Uh, it's cool. We're going to try and do something special in the new year. We haven't kind of really figured it all out yet, but we're going to do some kind of show that involves all of those guys. So um, We're not going to try. We will do. Well, we will, but, you know, yeah, okay, we are. We are going to do something involving those guys. Um, who knows? We may even try to come up with uh, kind of DRS returns for, for folk, but 
please, if you're listening to this and you want to come on, uh, just get in touch with us. Like we said, through the uh, the website, the email, the Twitter, because we want to get we want to beat the total. We want to get more than 25 DRSs next year. Definitely. Definitely, definitely. Thanks, everybody. And as we kind of said, you know, we had a lot of great guests. We're very thankful to all of them. Um, I think we mentioned all of them with the exception of Kyle from the Petrol Head Cafe. Uh, just the coolest idea, an amazing guy. Can't wait to check out the Petrol Head Cafe. Uh, Kyle, best of luck to you, man. But we have a, actually on our website, uh, dirtysideofthetrack.com slash special episodes. You just go to dirtysidetrack.com, click special episodes, and you'll see the guests listed out and your preferred podcast platform for each one as well as the veils tales that we've done and i gotta i we're going to talk a little bit more about veils tales so let's quickly at least i will let's quickly just say who we we covered we had jim clark nikki lauda michael schumacher juan manuel fangio alberto ascari chichio chichio and then uh, sir sterling moss um so check those out because i i that was one of it's about to be something i'm about to talk about in our end of year awards and with that, is that you? Is that you handing the baton over for our end of year? Yeah, we'll introduce Brian. it. Well, maybe I'll go with the first one. Okay, so we are obviously sitting here in full-on tuxedos, uh, a really swanky uh, reception. Uh, yes. Champagne is flowing, and sure, we are about yes. to. Pre- oh yeah, and we are about to present our end of season awards. And we decided, in the kind of end of season review with Paul and Rob, we've kind of done kind of uh, the classic. Uh, elements of uh, favorite parts of the season, worst race, all that kind of stuff. Um, but what we thought we'd do is we just wanted to give something out. So these are our um, inaugural Dirty Side Awards. Uh, we're going to go through about three or four each, maybe a little bit more because Brian gets excited and does too many. Uh, <laughs> run, so I will hand it around. over to you, Brian, to yeah. announce what is the award and who is the recipient of the award. The favorite moment of the year, according to Brian. And it's around Jack Villeneuve. But there's two parts. It was our prep work turning into a biography. I don't, I've said this before, but I don't think I can underscore this enough. Rob and I read actual books with pages. And we read it all. And we did homework. And we wrote out notes. And we made a biography. And it was just a biography. We looked at it. And I think both of us had highlighted certain parts of Jack's life we wanted to talk about. And it was Rob, so kudos to you, my friend. He said, all we've done here is create another Jack Villeneuve biography. If we tell him this, he'll be like, yes, so? <laughs> so so about about a week before the interview. And again, I know I've said this, but I don't think I can underscore what a realization this was. And it was pretty soon before the interview. I'm like, oh my God, we have to start over. And so we did, and we came up with questions. So that would be the first part of my favorite moment of the year. The second part of it is when the Zoom meeting started and we're in we're in the zoom and uh paul harris was there but he was on mute uh at a debrief with valtteri so apparently i think valtteri heard some of the interview possibly and so there we got three boxes rob Bryan and paul and then all of a sudden it says jack villeneuve joining the zoom i'm like what (laughs) and then it he joins and as Rob mentioned, I had to say this, he is reclining on his hotel room bed, and I'm like, what is happening now? I'm really confused. And then <laughs> and then Rob lost the ability to speak temporarily. No, we don't need to go near that bit. Let's just, this is the, the I, longest like, award speech ever. <laughs> yeah, I loved it. Favorite moment of the year for me. Back to you. <laughs> okay, well, mine, I've done four, and mine are all under the banner, the Awkward Awards. So I've got <laughs> the most awkward, and then insert name of award here. So I'll go off with my first... Uh, Three of them are kind of season-related. One of them is pod-related. So my funniest awkward moment of the year that still makes me giggle every time I think of it is Martin Brundle's grid walk at Miami. I just... I know we hit a little bit on the season review, but it is just the best thing ever where I don't think I've ever seen him so out of his comfort zone with literally not having a clue who anybody other than the drivers and the staff are on the grid. (laughs) And I know Paul told us that it was his worst grid of the year because it was way too overcrowded. And I think that just added to the entire awkwardness of the whole thing because he's desperately trying to find a celebrity that he just recognizes um, and then we have the infamous Patrick Mahomes moment. But so well, that was I my funniest. The other one was I'm a social media influencer, <laughs> and he's like, "What? I forgot about that." Till Paul reminded us. <laughs> That's true. So that was my funniest awkward moment of the year. I kept mine all about sort of the first year of the pod. So best benefit of the podcast was meeting like-minded F1 fans, and I know I kind of seasoned this in as we went. But from Nate to Rob Reed, two amazing guys and journalists. 
Paul Harris, you are amazing and utterly generous with your time, allowing us the chance to talk to Jack. And then people like Blake, who were just open and kind, the fifth wheel guys, and Kyle from Petrolhead, um, and all of the listeners. We are all a community of dirty siders, myself, Rob, and every one of you who listen, because we're all F1 fans. But another shout out for the Discord. It's folks from around the world, a great group of people. We do disagree on certain things, but it's never like a shouty yelly. It's kind of as we do here on the bar stools. Uh, let's talk about that. And I honestly think the dirty side has found the best parts of F1 Twitter and excluded all of the bad parts <laughs> because the people here at, in our community are so kind and thoughtful and generous with their time. It's like a club, but it's no longer secret. And we're all happy to be here. I love it. And I got to say, the songs, Andy, have been tremendous. The Brian sandwich rant and the Paul in the pits. And then finally, my last part of the benefit of the pod is when Paul and I ripped on Rob and his oh. soccer garage. No, that was my neck. Oh, man. I stole some so, thunder. I'm sorry, bro. You, you did, because my most uh, most up, awkward catching a host out moment of the award of the year, uh, the most awkward catching the host of the pod out of the year award is you two. Well, I can't say it because we're trying to avoid the E rating, but you two springing, you and Paul can elaborating behind my back to rip into me and me just sitting there open mouth listening to this it was funny but um ah oh, yes thank you thank you brian and paul for that well it's, uh, you should thank paul it was it was honestly his idea to me oh so you're throwing me under the bus now no i set it up <laughs> and then the two of us did it but it was it was a great idea from paul um my favorite things learned this year uh all really come from the veils tales Ascari's 1952 season, Clark's 1963 season are two of the best seasons ever in the history of F1, and they get so little appreciation because they're so long ago. Learning about those in the Veil's Tales was amazing. The fact that we, Ascari's nickname was Chichio, which means tubby, um, and Jim Clark will forever be in my memory. Or the fact that Juan Manuel Fangio, five-time F1 champion, that he was kidnapped in Cuba, effectively ending his career and propelling Castro to power in Cuba at the same time. What? And then <laughs> Schumacher would put team pictures and names on his driver room wall to learn them faster as the season started. Nicky Lauda had Lauda air. It crashed. Nicky himself helped investigate and force you know the answers to come out. And he has a kid now who's about eight, which is also confusing. And then Sir Sterling Moss and the amazing moral compass he has, which gave the 58 title to rival Mike Hawthorne. Man, I learned a ton from Vale's Tales. I almost used a bad word there, too. <laughs> and uh, I can't wait to do more of those. Actually, uh, they're not all awkward. This is the most heart-stopping moment of the season award. Uh, and it actually is a very late entry. It came up last week when after finishing our interview with Nate Saunders and being all oh. happy with ourselves that we had the best ever episode in the bag, Brian starts hitting me with WhatsApp in a frantic manner saying, dude, the Zoom meeting's not converting. It's just stopped at 50%. <laughs> it's frozen. I think we've lost the whole episode. Um, and he had to go out. And I'm like, just go out and see what happens when you get back. Um, and that was the longest wait, waiting for you to reply of whether we had anything left and were we even going to be able to get Nate back again to try and re re uh, re redo it all over. Um, so yeah, that was the most heart-stopping panic moment. That just pipped, because ahead of that, that was going to be the whole me at the uh, far end of my yard getting the text from um, Paul saying Jack's on in five minutes, and then me having to sprint to get set up. That would have been my heart-stopping moment. But I think last week actually trumps it, because I thought we'd just lost that entire me interview. Too. I, me too. I, I actually went, I was running around the house like uh, freaking out. <laughs> um, the best argument of the year, and it actually continues, is Nutella versus Nut Nutella. Nutella, Nutella, how do you say it? Yeah. It's Nutella, it's made out of nuts. It, but it's you, you... Nutella is the way it's pronounced. And so, it's it's got to you... be Nutella. It has to be Nutella. Nope. So anyway, if you were to open a browser, which I have, because I, I did research on this. I said, I, we can't be the only people who are trying to figure this out. So I did some research. And there's actually, if you Google simply two words together pronounce Nutella, the first thing that comes up is a box. And here is what it tells you the answer is. Nutella. Now, I know you'll disagree with that. Um, Obviously. But the, what's Computer really AI is wrong. <laughs> very fascinating. There's a little toggle switch in this fake little Google box. And it says American pronunciation. 
the only other choice is British, and here's the British. Nutella. So it's right. So the Brits are right <laughs> because you make Nutella out of nuts. Why would you get all these nuts and make a chocolate thing out and say, hey, what are we going to call this thing? Well, it's made out of nuts, so let's call it Newt. Like witches <laughs> make put Newts in their cauldrons. I mean, I why would you call it Nutella? I still couldn't disagree with you more. I mean, I couldn't. Oh, so anyway, I just, and I love the fact Google knows it's only the Americans and the Brits having this argument. So, <laughs> right. Well, okay. Well, now I move on to uh, most awkward pod moment of the year. I've given this to me trying to play along with your car crash of a oh, quiz <laughs> when oh you'd given me the world's worst instructions to how this quiz was actually going to work. And then we churned through probably the longest 15 minutes that we've had to push through to try to get that thing done. Um, hats off to you, Brian, for sticking with it. The fact that you even came up with your answers. Uh, the fact that you could write instructions to me that were that wrong. Um, <laughs> but in a bizarre way, I've actually come to kind of now love that quiz. Um, look back with it fond memories, but it's still going down as the most awkward pod, pod feature of the year. Sorry, <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. It didn't, some, you know, it ain't, it ain't all going to be gold. Um, <laughs> so my last one, uh, till we are, I have a joint one for us here, but my last one, most surreal moment of the year, and I'm gonna put a humongous pile of salt, not just a grain, on this one. But this did happen. I went to the Chicago Auto Show. And we were a relatively new pod at the time, so I'm wearing, it was a good podcast co-host, wearing a Dirty Side of the Track t-shirt, and my buddy and I are walking around checking out cars and having some beers, and we're sitting there at one point kind of having a bag of chips and, and a beer as a, as a nice dinner. Um, and as we're there, I, I mentioned to the lady in the running the beer garden, um, you know, how exciting the car show is. And she looks at my shirt and she says, oh, what's that? I said, oh, it's a Formula One podcast that uh, that I like. And she goes, oh, do you? I bet my son listens to it. I'm like, I bet he doesn't. Because we were really, it was very early on. Very early on. We had like seven listeners and six of them were my mom. And so like, you know, we're sitting there talking about it. And I said, well, I'm one of the co-hosts. And she said, no way. I said, yeah. I said, well, she said, well, good luck to you. I said, thank you. And I took my beer and I went and sat down. I took my friend's beer and sat down and he got the chips. And uh, we were just sitting there eating. And all of a sudden, she climbs down from the beer cart and walks over, and we're in, like, the dining area. And she says, hey, I texted my son, and he said he listens to your podcast. And I actually said, I think he may just be being nice to you. I doubt it, but thank you. And she shows me the text. She goes, no, he said he listens and he loves your pod. And she goes, can I take a picture with you? And I said, what? <laughs> and I said, Sure. And so she kind of takes like a selfie of the two of us and then walks back to the beer garden and uh, keeps working. And now every single person in the entire dining area is staring at me like, who is that guy? And my friend sitting there goes, do you think this person really listens to your podcast? I said, not a chance in hell. <laughs> and so, I mean, we, it was like March. We, had, we hadn't even done a race, I don't think, except for the one in 2021. So anyway, most surreal moment was that. And now if... Uh, and I'm drawing a blank on his name, but if you are listening, uh, please continue to. We were trading uh, IMs not all that long ago. I can't believe I'm drawing a blank. But I keep, would like to know if listening. this was if it was Max, real. So if if you've got a picture of, and I got to say this the right way, if you've got a picture of Brian with your yeah. mom, then <laughs> let us know because I would like I to know if you're the a real wrong listener. Way. <laughs> that was still not, the wrong way. It's not the math it comes out of; it's the mind it goes into. Brian. Mm -hmm. Nope. All right, and then just, Rob, do you have any more? Can I close with our joint one? You can close with the joint one, yeah. Okay. So it's a poorly kept secret. Rob and I work together. And this week we were on IM with a colleague who is a good guy. We don't know him super well. Um, so we were trading notes. He was going into a meeting and he needed some advice. And I said, could you just talk about the approach, either the time we do this particular thing or the person who does it, just see what they say. And then I wrote question period <laughs> and rob's on this chat along with this person who's not an f1 fan and so rob sees this and now it's off to the races rob says i'd say offer both if they want the best they may need to wait a bit if they come back and say this is so not right in question marks <laughs> in quotation marks then we'd have to tell them anyway so i saw this i said oh we're gonna go this strong are we and i wrote back just go in strong like you had a big bowl of porridge and then rob couldn't wait second later um, basically try the honest approach and just stop inventing. <laughs> and I've said, yep, we'll leave you alone. You know what you're doing. 
And then, and then he says, um, anyway, he'll pull it off. He's a smooth operator. So we left it at that. And then I felt so bad for like five minutes. I'm sitting here. I'm like, we have to explain to this guy that we're not just lunatics. And so I wrote, these are F1 quotes we're doing. Sorry. I still blah, can't blah. believe you did that. You gave in far too quickly on that one. I wanted to see what he came back with. Uh, because the funniest thing is, if we'd have been in an office together, sitting next to each other, then we would have seen each other giggling and doing this kind of <laughs> stuff. But in my mind's eye, every time I kind of fired one back and then I would see the little bubble coming up down the bottom Brian is typing I'm like oh yeah and I could just visualize you kind of like giggling to yourself as you're typing the next one in because I'm doing exactly the same thing back and it's it's not big it's not clever and it's not professional but it was a lot of fun it was so much fun so that's the winner of best work I am of the year award <laughs> jointly to Rob and Brian oh man right so I think I think that is uh, gonna be time to really call the curtain on season one of the dirty side um I, I've said this before to you, Brian, but thank you so much for convincing me to do this because I am traditionally, uh, I'm quite a creative person, but I'm also very lazy. So I would never have done this off my own back. I would never have even thought of Verse Dying a podcast. But once we got into it, you know, as we can see by the amazing liveries and World Cup mashups and all that kind of stuff, there's a creative spark in there. I'm just bone idle. So thank you for convincing me to get off my ass and uh, start doing this because it's been uh, an amazing year. Really looking forward to doing next year. Um, I'm hoping we can get... Uh, I don't know that we can ever possibly repeat the highs of some of the things that we've done this year, but I'm already counting down the days to Canada. I can't wait for Dirty Side on tour. I I can't wait as well. I am thankful you you said yes when we had this idea. I really enjoy working with you. And as I said before, in all seriousness, the listeners make this amazing. Um, just meeting everybody um, who loves F1 like we do. I've appreciated f1 more by doing this podcast if that makes any sense um, it, it does and i've i know what you mean because without this podcast i would never have even probably bothered trying to convince our local bar to start showing the races but then <laughs> right a, a big shout out to doba at the iron horse in unionville for putting those races on you've been amazing i know we haven't really filled the place yet we've had max kind of had like eight ten people in there i'm pretty sure we can do it again next season and get more in there but meeting some of the folk that have come in uh, there's a, some regulars that wear in their Red Bull and their Haas merch and just kind of like feeding off other people's like enjoyment of the sport is an angle I've never really done before. I kind of feel like I've, I've loved F1 for a long time, but I've kind of learned about it in a completely different way this year. Um, and I'm actually kind of, you know, the fact that a couple of times I've been torn as to whether I wanted to go and actually go to my uh, football practice on a Sunday morning or watch a race and the race has won out a couple of times because it's um, yeah I've absolutely loved it loved every aspect of it so um, can't wait for to do it all again next year yeah definitely me too uh, I'd echo everything you said and since we're putting this out on Sunday to whomever's lighting the first candle of Hanukkah a happy Hanukkah we're about a week away from Christmas Merry Christmas to everybody uh, Rob and I are taking a one-week break a one-week hiatus, so there will be no Christmas episode uh, that day. But we will be back uh, the day after New Year's, so one day late on that Monday, with the next episode as we launch Season 2. And, and, and I'm just, excited. Yeah, I'm excited as well, but what I am going to do is just temper people's expectations. So it's New Year's Day uh, that I fly back from the UK. First trip back to the UK since uh, since the, before the pandemic. So we, me and Brian have set the objective that we're going to try and record on the 2nd. I may be a little jet-lagged, so we're going to see how that one pans out. But um, it will be back, you know. It's, at least if we start there, we can only move up for season two. <laughs> exactly. So thanks, everybody, for making the first season so special. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did and Rob did. And we appreciate being part of your F1 routine. And uh, we're looking forward to next year. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Happy New Year. Happy end of 2022. We'll see you next year.